Celebrities these days just don't seem to age. We regularly see actors and media personalities in their 50s, 60s and beyond with smooth, tight skin that somehow looks natural. Such are the advances of cosmetic medicine. London-based aesthetic specialist Dr. Johnny Betridge has taken Instagram and TikTok by storm with his detailed assessments of the cosmetic work he believes celebrities might have had done. From Brad Pitt to Demi Moore and Jennifer Aniston, finally we get to understand just what might go into their ageless good looks. Today, Dr. Johnny Betridge joins me to reveal why he began creating these videos and to talk through the treatments and procedures he estimates some of the best known celebs have had done with a few surprises in there. And we discuss the eye-watering costs. The cosmetic interventions discussed by Dr. Betridge in this interview are statements of his professional opinion designed to offer an estimate of how aesthetic results can be achieved. We can't know for sure what cosmetic procedures individuals have undergone unless previously stated by them. Johnny, welcome to the channel. Thanks for being here. No, thank you so much for having me. Like, it was quite an honour to have you approach me. I've been, you know, seen some of your content on YouTube and you're doing an excellent job in the industry. Oh, thank you so much because I absolutely love your videos on Instagram. That is not an overstatement. I just think you do such a great job because I've worked in the press for decades now and you, you know, always go to doctors and ask them what they think celebs have had done and you might, um, you know, they might suggest one or two possibilities, but it's the way you pinpoint the procedures that I think is, it's just excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I think the series has kind of evolved over the last few months. I've actually had the time to dedicate properly to doing social media. And it takes a lot of work, as you know, to script, film, edit. Um, and this of celebrity face transformation series has just progressed and have I've had some great opportunities come from it with the reach that they've had. Um, which I think we're going to be exploring today, some of the ones that I've spoken about previously. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really looking forward to it. I think my audience is going to love this. And I think sort of my main goal behind it was to help sort of almost normalise these treatments, both non-surgical and surgical as well, because we often look up to celebrities and, you know, can appreciate how incredible some of them look. But the amount of work behind the scenes that goes into that mm. with their team, with their doctors, with their surgeons, is probably beyond what most people would expect. So I think it's, for me, it's about breaking down that taboo and providing that um, platform for people to realize that the reason they look this certain way is because they spent a lot of money on their face with some of the best doctors and surgeons to achieve that look. Yeah, you know, celebrities have always been subject to gossip and so on, but I think it is healthy to remind ourselves. I mean, I've looked at some of the people we're gonna talk about today, it was only in watching your videos that I realised that they had had work. And until that point, I felt like they were some kind of magical beings, you know, that um, it, it just, it just, the work was so natural that uh, it, it kind of hadn't crossed my mind, which sounds actually quite naive. They're all um, drinking the maternal youth potion. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. What, what what fountain are they drinking from? Take me to it. But that was where I wanted to start, actually, was that the cosmetic procedures and surgery of late seem to be way more sophisticated because in previous years you could tell when people have ha had had something done particularly surgery or fillers it was always just a look to them and it is getting harder to tell the work that celebs have done uh, which is why the way you unpick it is so so fascinating what do you think the key advances are that mean results just look that bit more natural these days? Yeah, I think what is a combination of lots of different things. I think when it comes to aesthetic treatments, there's like a kind of stepwise approach. You know, you start off with the sort of medical grade skincare, botulinum toxin treatments, injectable skin boosters, fillers, and then surgery. So a lot of people are incorporating all of these different as aspects to achieve their desired look and even thinking about sort of machine-based treatments as well you know sort of radio frequency microneedling mm -hmm. face tight em sculpt it's kind of a bit like a bubble of different options that patients can have so not not everyone is using the same modalities and i think often when the results look most natural is when practitioners have like a multimodal approach so they might be treating that patient with all of these different things that I just spoke about, mm. whereas some patients might just focus on the filler 
or go down the surgical option. So mm. in my clinic, I purely, you know, I'm injectables focused, so botulinum toxin, Botox as we know it, and filler-based treatments. So that's that's my niche. Mm-hmm. And I think what the natural results boil down to is number one, the person doing the treatment. Number two, how good they are. What's their artistic mm-hmm. eye like? Can they analyze someone's face? And choose treatments that's going to enhance the way that person looks, but not distort them. Because I see so much of the the overfilling and the distortion in my clinic, where patients have been treated in the formulaic approach, they've been completely overfilled, inappropriate treatments for their face. And actually, I always say good filler should not be noticeable. Mm. As in, the moment you can tell is a sign it's been done badly, in my opinion. Lip filler is one of the worst ones that we that we know about and you know Kylie Jenner and all that all the Kardashians have been you know absolutely pivotal in pe- in people driving or driving the success of lip filler across across the world uh, yeah. and people seeking that out having the overfilled lips is almost like a designer handbag it, it seems that we've been through a, a stage of that where people have had their lips filled almost to show like I've had work you know which, I, which I'm not a massive fan of I think you know you can have filler and Botox and still you know remain natural looking and Mm. and where I think things do go wrong is when patients are in that demographic of around 50 to 70 where they try and go I'm right bolt upright for this yes (laughs) well you look incredible how old are you if you don't mind me asking 51 you look incredible thank you so yeah I'd say within that age group there are certain patients that might come to me who are more suitable for a surgical approach I think that's where I'm very ethical and sensible in my approach where I turn patients away or say no, that actually what you're looking to achieve is not through Botox and fillers. The only way you can achieve the result you're wanting is through surgery. And I would prefer not to treat someone than give them a bad, okay result. Well, I've seen seen your results on your um, Instagram pages and yeah, really impressive. I'm always very frank. I'm like, you know, open and honest thing. I I always say I would be doing you a disservice Mm-hmm. If we did this treatment, you'd be better off saving up for, you know, a face and neck lift in five to 10 years time, rather yeah. than wasting your money with me and you getting an underwhelming result. Um, and that's where we've seen a lot of celebrities. They've always, a lot of them have had quite a few mishaps with filler. They then dissolved it and they've had surgery. That mm-hmm. that seems to be a very, very common trend. Even yeah. with the likes of, you're know, just thinking Bradley Cooper and Simon Cowell, they were, they were, I'm convinced they were went through a phase of a bit of overfilling and started to look quite puffy and full in their face. But actually, that was not necessary to their benefit. And then I think they've then reached an age where they thought, no, let's re- rethink this, dissolve surgery. So that, well, that, definitely, ha- that definitely happens. I was going to ask about Simon Cowell because he is somebody who, bless him, has been more open about what he's had done. I mean, some would say, well, he couldn't avoid it. He was getting so much, um, you know, speculation around him. But he did say, yeah, look, I overdid it. But I, what I wondered about with Simon Cowell is, you know, are some people just not suited to Botox in that it seemed to have more of a profound impact on his look than others have had? You know, he kind of had, it, it just, his face just looked completely unnatural. And you think, was well, that because it's like, you know, hasn't has been unlucky about what he's had done or is that a reaction? I think it was a combination of, too much Botox, so he didn't really have much movement. The lines were completely gone, which again is a you know the the benefit of Botox. But he was very frozen. I think also what I think what not necessarily went wrong, but I think he had too much skin removed when he had a blepharoplasty. Oh, okay. So what actually happens when they do the eye procedure? They base there's something called an ellipsis. This is a medical term for a section of skin. So they basically cut a crescent shaped part of the skin away stitch it back up but if you actually look at the shape of his upper eyelids in here they've almost taken too much away and that changed the overall shape of how his eyes look Mm. because that's such a dominant feature of the face it obscured his eye shape quite significantly like you look at some of the photos I think more so on his left side I think I can't remember exactly where where you can actually see the change in the eye shape and that's as a bad side effect obviously not so well done blepharoplasty that that's what it looks like to me 
Okay, that's interesting. And and in the press, uh, you know, we've we've blamed the the Botox and the fillers, but actually there was there was something else going on there. That we... I think most recently I did a video on him, which you may have seen, where he was wearing glasses and looking more natural. Even though he said they were for migraines, yes, I probably agree with that to some extent. But is he hiding some eye surgery correction mm. potentially? Mm. Because his face was looking improved than how it did even in last year. So I, I, I have a feeling, and I've spoken to my plastic surgery colleague, there's been some degree of surgical revision, I think, because he looks improved. So he's he's definitely, obviously, I can't say definitely, but based on my knowledge and speaking to colleagues, you know, the, the change is likely a surgical revision, I think. Okay. And even though he denies that, he's, he denies having a facelift, but you, you can't get that result without having surgery. You know, that that's not possible. Yeah, well, that's why we need you to find these things out. Um, and you can see the facelift scar here. Yeah, Plastic okay. Appearance. I point that out quite a lot in Brad Pitt's video, Bradley Cooper. I'm going to come on to Brad Pitt just now. I'm glad you mentioned him because he was the one that I looked at and really did think he was the real life Benjamin Button. I mean, just looking incredible for his age. And that's why it is healthy to talk about these things because otherwise you go through life and you just think there's these people that, that are just, you know, incredible. Um, and, and it makes, I, I think there's a certain amount of people looking at celebs who they don't realize have had work done and and makes you feel a bit you know down on yourself because like well why can't I look like that I mean Brad Pitt you um who looks fantastic yeah. but you you think he might have had a little bit of help yeah so I think when I actually made the video his transformation was most noted even last year at Wimbledon so we're talking mm -hmm. summer 23 mm -hmm. when but I think it kind of went under the radar and people didn't necessarily acknowledge it as much as they did when I did this video recently um and if you just look back at previous photos where you know he's shown those features of aging you know mid face volume loss the lower face laxity the jowling as well and then when you compare those images where his face is looking much tighter more youthful and again the, the face the scar was very ba bang in your face obvious to to a trained eye when they know what and that was around here yeah, because yeah. when, when they do a facelift, they do two two scar um, correct like where they actually form the incisions and then stitch it is mm -hmm. in front and behind the ear. Mm. And often what happens, obviously, they they put it here to make it as neat as possible. And often what happens is it changes the position and shape of the patient's earlobes because they almost try and make it like a seamless um, integration with that part of the face. So when when you do look in that area, it's kind of a giveaway. Where you can see that change yeah and that, that's what was most notable to me and a lot of the celebrities that i've spoken about where you can where you can see that yeah and i i think it does go under the radar now because the standard of facelift and the technique being used is obviously so different because you could always tell when somebody had a facelift yeah. before because even if it was nicely done there was just a different look to their face and you don't see that now. You just see these subtle changes where you're like, whoa, they're looking really good. Yeah. Like, I, I'm obviously not a plastic surgeon, but you know, having spoken to, you know, my surgical um, colleagues that you know, the, the innovative techniques, what they're using to, you know, give that natural result, it definitely changed their approach. Mm -hmm. And I think some some surgeons do definitely give that more pulled look. So I think it goes back to the, you know, the fact that who's doing the procedure. Yeah. You know, some surgeons may give that very pulled and dramatic look. Others adopt a more sort of subtle approach where it's just a, a slight lift. So I think with all of these treatments, Botox, fillers, surgery, it's a spectrum. Yeah. And it boils down to who do you go to, what look are you wanting? And ultimately that that's what affects your outcome. That's why doing research is, is key uh, yes. if you're wanting to look natural and normal. Yeah, and, and I mean, doing doing research and choosing the right surgeon is just, that just really through their galleries. I mean, obviously they're going to share their best sh shots. Have you got any tips for people on how you do find a surgeon who gives these incredible natural results? I think it all all comes down to you know the background experience of that practitioner. You know, what's their previous work life? How long they've been doing plastic surgery for? Are they are they a specialist in their area? Because quite a lot of surgeons are a bit of jack of all trades, so they'll do you know, face, nose, breast, body, which is a red flag for me. I'd only ever okay. go to someone who is focused on a specific area. So there are deep plane facelift specialists there or you no know, face and neck, nose, body, breast, you know, that kind of thing. So I think 
at least a few years experience, you know, credible surgical background, you know, focused on a specific part of the face. So they're not, you know, jack of all trades, as I said. And I think reviews as well, obviously, how you can only go by what, what you see online. But again, and also recommendations. I think, you know, a lot of you know, word of mouth in any industry is often the most powerful form of marketing. So I think it's a combination of surgical experience, specific area focused of the body reviews, and then word of mouth, I think, is and, and results as well. Yeah. You know, seeing that are they visible in social media, what mm -hmm. results they're putting out, how do they talk about these procedures, mm -hmm. what 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 they like as a person, because this industry is so saturated where you know you go and Google facelift or lip filler or Botox, you'll have hundreds and hundreds of options. And I think it all boils down to do you trust that person that you're seeing on social media? Because yeah. ultimately that that's you know what you've got to rely on in a way. Um, it, 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 it's, there's no there's no hard and fast rules. I think it's 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 difficult, and I and I do see that with patients who who found me. They say, you know, I, I found it really challenging to you know you know locate someone to trust them mm -hmm. and not feel like I'm going to be you know used as a money making machine because yeah, there's a lot of unethical practice in my industry, and I see that a lot of the aftermath of it, which is very sad. Yeah, and it does it as you say. It makes it very difficult for patients because it's a heck of a lot of trust that you have to put into to somebody who is uh, deciding the future of your face, basically. And you just got to hope these are the right hands. Yeah. And some of these, you know, the facelift surgeon that I often refer to, you know, he's charging about thirty thousand pounds for a face and neck lift, and then the top surgeons in America, you're talking a hundred to five hundred thousand dollars plus. You know, they're charging okay. huge money. I have to do quite a bit more saving than I'd ever realised unless I want to go down the naturals. This is pushing me down the natural route. <laughs> it's, 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 you know, that's, that's some people's salary. That's a deposit on a house. You know, these... Massive, yeah. Crazy. So, you know, people who are doing these treatments have got obviously a fair amount of disposable income. Mm. And it's not, this is not available to everyone. No, absolutely not. Um... I wanted to stick with the men if we could, which is quite refreshing in itself because it's usually women who who come under um, this kind of analysis. But uh, this is another great looking guy in midlife, a national treasure here in the UK who's coming up for 49. It's David Beckham. Yeah. Because I did notice in his recent documentary that his eyelids um, are differently shaped to his younger days and uh, you know what what have you noticed about his how his looks have changed yeah i'd say particularly for him looking from the top down i'd say likely a hair transplant his hairline has definitely changed in the last few years i think i myself have had a hair transplant around two years ago so i think it's mu right. becoming much more common practice for men to do this both in the uk and massively in in turkey you know, health tourism tourism is huge is huge for that and lots of other treatments so i say for him hair transplant change of hairline i think also you mentioned the hooded eyes you know many celebrities have had a blepharoplasty mm. even just thinking the likes of taylor swift and you know some of the female celebrities okay. jennifer lawrence i could list off a reel of them oh my goodness i just would have yeah. never have thought of that. honestly I, okay. the, the most common area people are getting at the moment is blepharoplasty so eyelid surgery you can get upper and lower eyelid surgery to remove that hooded look Mm -hmm. Now, after this call, just go and look at a few celebrities and you'll realise how many are doing it. Because uh, well, I don't even, it doesn't creep and cross my mind with the younger ones. I think, oh, they won't be doing that. I'm really just looking at older people. But uh, yeah, wow. So back to David Beckham. So yeah, his eyelids have definitely changed. He was very hooded and mm -hmm. particularly on the upper portion. So definitely I'd, I would be pretty sure that he's had some surgical treatment there. And Botox. 100%, you know, I think everyone's doing Botox nowadays. Um, but I'd say one of the most natural ones is Anne Hathaway. She has, she, whatever she's having done, and she's one of the ones who's extremely hard to pinpoint. Like, I've looked at her in detail. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like, str I've been struggling. I, I haven't, I've made a video on her, but a very generalised one. But she's someone who's definitely had something, but I don't exactly know what, which is a good sign. We want to know who she's going to. Yeah. <laughs> the way she is she is glowing and looking very youthful yeah no i love that natural look and it's actually it's incredible what is achievable nowadays it really is i mean if you have the money you really facially do not need to age right. um i want to move on just to a couple of, of female icons then seeing as we're, we're going down this route um 
I want to start with the one and only Jennifer Aniston, who has managed to maintain a really naturally ageless look at 55. Um, how do you think she might have done that? Yes, yeah, so I actually did a video on her recently mm. where I thought she was looking, so a few people were tagging me in, a, in some videos on TikTok that like, said her face looked... has changed quite a bit in the last few years. Mm -hmm. I'd say she's someone who looks like she's had some surgical facelift, I'd say. Given the fact that only a few years ago versus now, she looks quite si similar, as in she hasn't got much you know, facial laxity, the volume loss in her face isn't that significant. So, it, And she looks like this area here has been pulled back slightly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'd be close to saying that I'd say some facelift intervention, mm -hmm. combination of Botox and fillers, I think pretty much the same approach like a lot of celebrities are having at the moment. Yeah. She's, she's hard to tell, but I think given the fact that, you know, if you look at her face over the last few years, she's she looks to be someone who's had, had treatment. Yeah, and I mean, these are the people you look at and just think, I'd love to know who they're going to, who, the, who those surgeons are. Well, do you know another interesting one is um, Demi Moore, who I, kn I know that you did a video on. I, you know, I'm fascinated in all of them. But what I thought was really nice about, about Demi Moore, I mean, she's just one of life's great beauties, but she did go through a period of looking slightly less like herself and yeah. What's lovely is that modern aesthetics have brought her natural beauty right back. And even knowing that's possible, but these things are reversible now and that you can, it's almost like miraculous to see somebody kind of restored like that. Um, what, what did you put that down to? Yes, yeah, so I think a few, she walked in Fendi, I can't remember what, what year it was. It must've been two plus years ago when that's what sparked speculation about her face where she looked a bit like, oh, what what's she done mm -hmm. type thing. I think at that moment she'd had buckle fat removal. That was a that's been quite went through quite a big trend where having the fat removed in this area of the face to slim it down. Mm -hmm. In the likes of Chrissy Teigen also, who's had that done, mm -hmm. and that became quite you know prominent treatment everyone was inquiring about. So that and it, but it also leads the patients to look quite gaunt and sunken mm -hmm. if it's not done on the right person. Guess it will slim the face, but if you're actually taking the fat away it can make you look, you know, sort of a bit unwell, I think, in some, yeah. in some patients and, and not give you that fresh, plump look. Um, and then we saw her come out recently and she's 61, I think. And, and she was looking much improved and almost like she'd had a recent facelift as well or some surgical correction to how she looked previous years. Much more contoured lower face, appeared more lifted, more youthful looking. So... Again, another celebrity who might have done some things to alter her appearance that she particularly mm. might not have liked, or didn't, you know, the outcome wasn't as hoped, and then gone through that, you know, transition where things have been revised, improved, you know, whether that be through different modalities, like I said earlier, surgical, non-surgical. Yeah. And then she came out recently and she looks amazing. So Yeah, and you're absolutely right. She is 61 and just absolutely stunning. I wanted to ask you about somebody else who you've already made me really jealous by telling me that they follow you that's like the peak Kathy, Kathy Hilton icon total icon yeah no she um followed recently I said well if you're ever in London I'm here for you <laughs> call me <laughs> yeah she looks fantastic I'd be pretty surprised if she hasn't had some surgery to look like that you know she I think you mentioned earlier she's 60 64 um and she really she looks terrific but I have always noticed with her that um, in recent years, she has this uniform plumpness to her skin, which I thought was really nicely done at her age. It was just, there was nothing kind of particularly overfilled, but she just yeah. was absolutely lineless. And I thought, mm, I mean, really, I thought that was quite sophisticated. Um, again, you know, for, for her age group, she just looks great. Um, yeah, any, any speculation on what kind of is that just filler or yeah, so I, I'm going to repeat myself again it's that mm. multi-modal approach with mm. Botox fillers surgery and skin resurfacing so combining those treatments together you know from the base basis obviously it's probably a surgical facelift to give that tightness remove the lower face laxity you know under eyes upper eyes to give that youthful look 
and then combining that with Botox to reduce line formation, subtle touches of filler to restore, you know, specific areas of volume loss. And then you've got the sort of machine-based treatments like micro radio frequency microneedling, VO2 mm. laser, which resurfaces the skin texture and quality. So it's not just a single treatment alone that's leading to that appearance. There's so much that goes into someone looking like that and to, yeah. and to keep them looking natural. Yeah, yeah, really nicely done. Um... Expensive upkeep, you know, you know, we see the we see these celebrities and well-known people and think, God, I'd love to look like that. But the actual cost involved is is, is huge. You know, that's yeah. that's not a cheap, cheap, um, cheap thing to do. <laughs> no, when you said five hundred thousand dollars for a facelift, that has actually blown my mind. I mean, that's there are some surgeons, a particular surgeon in um, America who's well known for charging upwards of I think I think he starts at two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. He's probably one of the most expensive. Nice work if you can get it. <laughs> I'm interested as to why you think celebs are still so reluctant to admit having surgery or procedures. I mean, they're always asked and, you know, you can you can hear them say, oh, I have a little red light or there's just such vagueness. I mean, why do you think that's that taboo still is there? Because they're all at it. You know, that much is clear from this conversation. Um, it would kind of be better if it was all out in the open and and you know it, it would just lift the lid on the industry and then there's more information available to who the good surgeons are and why do you think that's still that's still in place that i taboo? think the taboo definitely transcends normal people right through to celebrities i think the taboo of it is definitely decreasing mm. but i think with celebrities they often are asked and there is definitely a general res reservation I, I can't think of many celebrities celebrities who've openly spoken and admitted to surgery. No. I think they almost want to, you know, protect themselves, I guess. They don't want to open themselves up to um, criticism, speculation. And I think it's not necessarily something they want to be known for. Mm -hmm. I think they kind of want to be known for what they do, whether that mm -hmm. be, you know, film, TV, fashion. Um, and I think in some industries, it's almost frowned upon, I think, even the likes of, you know, the models out there, they're, they're definitely getting some degree of, of treatment, like Bella Hadid, just thinking off the top of my head. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I think that, that sort of declaration where I've done treatments almost puts you at an inferiority position. Yeah. That, that's what I would say it boils down to. It's almost like putting your head above the parapet. No one wants to be, put themselves up to, to possibly no be, to be the one. Down. And no one wants to be the one to take the lead on that. But I think, you know, I guess as you know, lay people, do we we have an expectation for that? And I think should we, you know, feel that celebrities need to tell us what they have done? I think no, but I also think there should be a transparency because mm -hmm. celebrity culture has such a big influence on us and our generation and people growing yeah. up even more so. When I even when I was growing up, it was is was less so than it is now. So I think there is some degree of social responsibility as well for people to be a bit more open with what they've had done. Like, for example, Simon Cow, he's admitted to Botox mm -hmm. and fillers, but denies surgery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I, I get what you're saying. It's great that you've admitted to that, but why are you denying the surgery as well? So we need more Sharon Osborne's in this world. She'll tell you exactly what she's had done. <laughs> And, and she talks about she talks about her weight loss and you know she's just very open um about about what happens to her and, and what she's had done and so on and I, I think that's just quite healthy but she's she's not fighting for a multi-million dollar movie role which which at the end of the day has brings us unique pressures and you can kind of see but like like you say I think it just would be healthier if, if we could get to the the point where people just talked openly about what they had done so we all understand where the bar lies and um, what's achievable naturally and what's not. That would be ideal, I think, but I think, I don't think it'll ever happen. <laughs> we'll, st we'll still be waiting, yeah. People want, people, want to, people want others to think that they're as natural as possible and they look like that because they were born that way. But unfortunately, I think the likes of me, I think I'm there to break down that, you know, barrier to yeah. open up the floor to discussion and, make people realize that actually they look this way because of X, Y, Z. Yeah, it's a great thing. Um, and I, I know through my channel, when I talk about my own kind of internal battle with how far 
I should go to improve my own aesthetic. And you know, one day I'll be like, do you know what? I'm just, I'm just gonna leave things and do things as naturally as possible. And the other day I'll be like, one of these days I'm gonna have a full facelift. And I just think people are like that. It's because there are so many options out there. They're not all affordable. So you've got to wait way up price as well. But I just think a lot of people in their, their middle age years, and you must see it, are just constantly trying to weigh up. Like if I have this done, then when does it stop? You know, how far do I go? These are difficult decisions actually in, in this day and age. Yeah, and absolutely. I think once you get on that path, people think you can't get off it. And I think that's where the responsibility lies with surgeons and doctors because often we look at someone who may look overdone and think oh why do they look like that you know what have they done to their face but in reality there's people doing that the practitioners who are also responsible and I think that's where when I always I said this in a video recently ethics slide when money's involved mm -hmm. and there's money to be made it's a business at the end of the day so there, there are a lot of people doing treatments on patients who probably don't need this doing or who actually aren't suitable from a medical, physical or psychological standpoint. So there's, there's the lines are so blurred and you know, where do you draw the line and how do you ensure ethical, responsible clinicians, natural results across the spectrum? You, you can't. Um, and I, I think for me, it definitely boils down to the patient responsibility with all of this as well. Yes, the people who are seeking these treatments out, I say, don't be driven by price. Do your research carefully. Don't make decisions on a whim. It's your face. You And I always say to my patients as well, you do not need these treatments. These are a luxury and it's nice to be able to have it as a possibility where you can improve your look or change the way you look. But again, it, it's definitely, you know, th th there is a responsibility on both sides, I, I say as well. Mm. It's not always... The, the patient's fault definitely practitioner influence as well quite quite significantly i think okay well i wondered if we could finish up with what i call a quick fire round something i've just brought in where i i would um name some common cosmetic issues and see if there's a treatment that comes to mind that you think might work best okay can i say what can i often put in a bad treatment that people think might help but doesn't even better yeah okay. Okay, well, the first one is jowls, sagging jowls. Fine. Okay, so can I elaborate on this a bit more? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd say, number one, it depends on the degree of jowl and mm -hmm. how much lower face laxity there is and does it extend into the neck area. Okay. The most definitive treatment for jowls and neck laxity on a patient of, let's say, 50 plus, surgery. Okay only way to get a definitive lift and to correct jowls would be a surgical treatment. However, if you've got patients in their sort of early 20s, early 30s, who might just have some chin hollows with minimal jowl formation, you can actually inject the chin hollows called the pre-jowl sulcus, which is the hollowing in front of the jowl, and restore that volume loss. Okay. I often do that on quite a lot of my patients. And then you've got threadless, which I absolutely hate. There are yes. jowl, you can do jowl lifts with threads as well, but mm -hmm. I personally don't like threads simply because the lifting effect is very short lived and high risk of complications, scarring, skin puckering, and the actual results are very underwhelming and the mm. expense is quite high. So you're not the first person to say that on this channel. Yeah. Don't yeah. do threads. Consider filler if you're young and don't have much lower face laxity, but the definitive treatment would be surgery. Okay, I think it might be a similar one for this one, but anyway, I'll just see. Sagging eyelids, asking for a friend. I'll always say that. Sagging eyelids, blepharoplasty, the only way you can treat that. I think I even got a message earlier today saying, what non-surgical treatments do you do for sagging eyelids? I'm like, I don't, it needs surgery. I keep hearing this. That's my problem, area, and I'm like, yeah, I just can't bring myself to do it. But anyway, maybe one day. Well, if you need a good surgeon, I know someone, so let me know. Well, I would definitely ask you. You bet I would. <laughs> I'm looking for your recommendations. Um, eye bags. I get asked about that a lot. Eye bags are a difficult one. Again, eye bags is a spectrum. Again, sorry to answer these in a roundabout no, way, but to be precise with my answer. Um, so you can under eye hollowing or eye bags. Again, it starts off minimal hollowing right through to an eye bag where you might get ex like sort of extensive puffiness here mm -hmm. where the eye bag actually protrudes out. Called, it's called eye bag herniation where it just sticks out. 
So the way to treat an eye bag would be through surgery, but the way to treat under eye hollowing, that's what we call a tear trough hollow in this area of the face, you can actually treat with filler. So a lot yeah. depends on the under eye appearance. And a lot of people think you can treat bags with filler. Actually, that would make it worse. Um, so it depends on the, the degree of bag hollowing and all that kind of thing. All right, got you. Um, the next one is facial fat loss. If you've lost a significant amount of, of fat in your face, what's the best way of... Again, it's, oh, yeah, the degree of facial volume loss. So I you know, I think of a patient I treated recently, a 47-year-old um, female patient who had lost quite a lot of weight and the face had started to sort of move downwards, had quite a lot of volume loss to her face. So filler was actually really a great treatment for her. So she's someone who had a 13 mil filler, full face rejuvenation, and she looked insane. Um, whereas I guess if you go down the path of significant facial volume loss with you know further laxity, you'd be more down the sort of surgical route. So again, it, it boils down to the spectrum thing, how much laxity there is, what's the volume loss like. Some might be amenable to the filler. Some obviously if it's if there's too much laxity would, would be more of a surgical candidate. Okay, got it. Um the next one, final one, because I was gonna ask about turkey neck, but that's been covered in the the jowls, I think. Um the next one is just that general loss of of elasticity, you know, wrinkled skin. Yeah. So I'd say, number one, uh, decent skincare routine. So I'm sure you and your viewers have heard about medical grade skincare. I think having sort of an expert knowledge input into your skincare routine. Botox, love that treatment. Everyone needs it. Great for treating fine lines and wrinkles. Gives a nice refreshed look. And then you've got the uh, skin boosters like Profilo, which is mm. injectable moisturizer. So injectable hyaluronic acid. And then you've got the sort of skin resurfacing treatment. There's so many different options out there. I actually had one recently called Neogen. It was like a plasma based heat treatment. It was quite an interesting treatment, actually. Um, there's so Did you notice a difference on your skin afterwards? A bit, bit more of a glow and hydrated look. Mm -hmm. I think the main aim was to disrupt the skin surface barrier and help boost collagen and elastin production. So I think you have to, I've got to have two further sessions, but, mm -hmm. but a very subtle change. I think there's there's so many different machines out there. It's difficult to know what to, yeah. what actually works. Yeah. CO two resurfacing, like, like laser, like laser treatments. They they've been transformative for a lot mm. of faces. I'd say CO two laser is probably one of the most popular, most effective treatments for, for skin resurfacing. Fantastic. So again, it's combination skincare, Botox, skin boosters, plus or minus a few machines. Yeah. And a yeah. small amount of filler where appropriate. And a good practitioner. That's always the name of the game finding that good practitioner that's going to honestly that's result. what it boils down to because i you know i was making a video earlier where i say i said that one mil can look unnatural 10 mil can look look natural it all boils down to who's behind that needle mm -hmm. and who they're treating great place to finish thank you so much i could talk to you all day and list every celebrity i think of and go on and on and on but we gotta stop somewhere it was really good to talk to you i think it's I think it's important to open up this conversation to, you know, make people realise that what we see on social media is not always as it seems. And there are there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes um, from medical professionals to help celebrities look this way. Yeah. So, yeah, I think don't knock yourself too much. Thank you, Johnny. So appreciated. Well, I don't know about you, but I feel it helps to understand just exactly what goes into looking ageless or as close to it as you can get in later life. Celebrities often rely on their looks to continue working, so it's completely understandable that they would seek out these treatments. But it's also not healthy for the rest of us to try to compare ourselves to those standards. And so I think Dr. Johnny Betridge is doing a great job of shedding light on just what it takes. But what do you think? Were there any surprises in there for you? Do you think celebs should be more open about the work they've had done and who did it so that we can remove the taboo and stigma around it? As always, I love to hear your thoughts in the comments. And if you enjoyed this interview and haven't already subscribed, then by doing so, 
you make sure you don't miss future videos from me. I'll link to Johnny's Instagram and TikTok accounts in the description if you want to follow his videos and you'll find more information and advice from me around how to age well on my website honest.scot. Scroll down any page to sign up for my monthly newsletter and you're automatically entered into my giveaways for newsletter subscribers. But for now, thank you for being here today. I'll see you next time.